Good morning, Rethinking Church Summit. We are so glad to have you all back for day two. Um, I am excited. I know that Lakeisha is excited. Um, day one was absolutely amazing. Um, of course, I was in certain workshops, but every single one of them um, was top notch. The material, the resources, um, the presenters were so gracious, and so we're just so excited um, to be back for day two, for round two, to just build on top of what has already been established. Um, this morning's um, keynote speaker um, is an amazing person, an amazing servant, and so we're excited to have him on board. But before we get to that, um, I'm just going to share a few announcements with you all. Uh, let me pull this back up. Um, so one of the things that we continue to do on yesterday, but we just want to reiterate, um, is the capability of networking. And so one of the amazing features of this platform is the networking feature. Um, and so we just want to encourage you all to use that, um, especially during those 15 minutes uh, breaking uh, break times. You can use that, um, but also just afterwards, um, once the day is over, Go back, make some notes, write some names down, and network with those people. That's what we're here for. Um, you can look. It should be on the left side of your screen. If you have not located that feature, reach out to one of us, and we will certainly help you. Um, for Think Tank participants, uh, we have, are already receiving um, information and work that you all are doing, which is completely exciting um, because we know that uh, this is just, we're just planting the seeds right now, but we're certainly looking forward to the harvest in the future. And so um, think tank groups, please make sure that today you are identifying the uh, work that you want to do and that you are also pinpointing the person that will be making the presentation on tomorrow. So everyone will will get to see all of the uh, work that has already been done. But also, um, I hope you've been able to see the video that Lakeisha posted on yesterday about the symposiums that will happen in the next few months. And those will be free. Um, and so we just, we're gonna just continue the work. So Think Tank participants, please make sure that you're aware of that. Um, with the networking and the uh, messaging system, please make sure that you are checking your mail so that way you're able to stay on top of who's trying to connect with you and that you're connecting with the proper people. Um, we did, We of course, this is a new platform. We're all learning it. And so um, we just want to give you some reminders to make sure that if possible, that you're using this platform on a laptop or desktop um, and not your um, tablet or phone. Um, and videos and presentations will be sent on or by Saturday, I should say, not on Saturday, but by Saturday, sometime in there. Um, there's some um, background things that need to happen with that, and it's taking a little bit more time. So please give us a little bit of grace, and we will make sure that you get those. We know a lot of you are anxious to have that information at your fingertips, but please know that it is happening. Um, please also visit the expo. Um, we have some really amazing people there and some organizations and businesses, and so we want you to see them, but we also want you to support them. So um, please take the time throughout the day um, and after everything is over to utilize those resources. Um, so this morning, Lakeisha will be introducing our keynote speaker, and I'm going to turn it over to her. Thank you so much, Quinta. And um, yes, we are so excited. Um, yesterday was just amazing. It exceeded my expectations because I woke up yesterday morning and I said everything that could go wrong is going to go wrong today. And uh, I think when you approach it that way, that everything that happens good is like a bonus. So, so we're happy to only have a few um, technology glitches. And thank you all just for being patient with us because as Quinta said, like this is a new technology. It's our first time using it. It's most of your first time using it. So you know, stuff happens. And if you reach out to us, we'll do our best to try to resolve those issues. But yeah, stuff happens. So just be patient and enjoy the moment. I know you all want the playback, but enjoy the moment that you're in. And if you miss the sessions, we promise we're going to get that information to you. But, you know, we have to sleep as well. And um, so <laughs> once this is over, usually like we're going straight to bed because it um, it's a lot of work. So thank you guys so much. But I'm here to announce, to introduce to present Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley. 
oh my goodness. So I was reading his bio and I was trying to figure out like, what do I say? Because one, there's no way I could read all of that to you all. And two, like he's just doing an amazing work. And that's one of the reasons we felt it was important to have his voice to be on this platform, because not only is he a pastor and a social justice advocate and a scholar, he's a man of God who is serious about God's people. And that is the heart of this event is for us to share with you people who are not only doing the work, but have a heart for God's people. So we're not just, you know, putting out content, but we want to put out content that's going to edify um, the body. He is the eighth pastor in the 217 year history of Alfred Street Baptist Church. Um, hold on a second. He is a part of the inaugural cohort of only 10 students at Christian Theological Seminary for a PhD in African American preaching and sacred rhetoric, which is a huge deal. Not only is getting a PhD a huge deal, but to be in a program of only 10 persons to participate in this first project is a major deal. So we are um, very proud of him for um, in all the things that he has going on to add that to his plate. Under his leadership, Alfred Street Baptist Church has grown from 2,500 members to 10,000 members. Plus, they have millions of viewers. I think on his website, he said thousands, but I looked at some of the YouTube videos and they have millions of viewers tuning in. And if you're his friend on, or if you follow him on Instagram, you can really feel his heart for social justice because when things happen, he, he is not shy about sharing how he feels. And I think that that's the passion that we need to have around this work. It's not a stoic work, but you got to put your heart in it. And I think he did one um, session where he had to apologize because he was so passionate about something that he stated, but he was not um, too arrogant to come back and say that the statistic that he, um, that he put out there was incorrect, but his passion still remains. Um, he, one of his sermons was acknowledged in Time Magazine. I think it was the sermon around Trayvon Martin. His church donated $1 million to the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And he has sermons archived in their faith-based collection. If that tells you just how powerful his preaching and teaching is. And I know he's probably sitting there like, oh my God, <laughs> you're setting me up. <laughs> you're setting me up. But I just want everyone who may not know you to have an understanding of just how much of yourself you put into your work and what they're in for today. So we thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule, not only to come and present, but yesterday you were here, you were interacting with people. And I know that it just like lit some people up to um, actually have like that level of access to you. So we thank you so much for, um, for being here with us and for the presentation that we are about to receive from you. So without further ado, we have none other than the Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley. Welcome to the Rethinking Church Virtual Summit. Wow, man, you talk about making somebody feel good. Lakeisha, I got to bring you on staff here at Alpha Street because uh, you made me feel good about myself today. Praise the Lord, saints. Good morning, everybody. Grace and peace be unto you from God who loves us as father and mother and Jesus Christ, our resurrected, risen, reigning and returning redeemer. Let me tell you how excited I am for this opportunity to share this Wednesday morning with you. And I want to thank all of you from around really the nation and the globe who've taken some time out to join in with us in an amazing platform. And I want to recognize Quinta and Lakeisha for the vision that calls us to this space and time to really become like the sons and may I add daughters of Issachar, who we read about in First Chronicles chapter 12, who understood the times and knew what Israel must do. And we gather in this virtual space really to reflect upon and understand the times in which we live, the season that God has created, and what it means to be church and to be faithful. Um, so I want to thank you all. I want to thank Lakeisha and Quinta. I also want to acknowledge all of our presenters and speakers. Yesterday, Lakeisha said that we were all experts in our field. And I, I kind of felt bad because when I saw Dr. De La Torre, when I saw Dr. Smith, Dr. Teresa Fry Brown, they all have earned PhDs um, and I'm trying to get past comprehensive. So I wouldn't call myself an expert. As a matter of fact, I don't think one can ever become an expert in pastoring. What we can seek to do is become faithful. And my greatest desire is to be faithful over 
the people and the season that God has called me to be a servant leader here at Alpha Street Baptist Church. So I'm grateful for just a few moments of reflecting on church, where we are and where we're headed. I'm going to say this repeatedly throughout this presentation that um, I'm going to speak from a contextualized experience of Alfred Street, but hopefully be able to raise some universal questions that we can all uh, discuss in our various contexts, realizing that every answer for every church will be different. The questions may be the same, but how they're answered in the local congregation will be different. Um, and so, Quint, if we can go to the first slide, I want to kind of put a tag and title on this presentation um, about rethinking church and calling it the doors of the church are not open. Um, rethinking church when there's no building. If we can put up that first slide right here, the title one. So anyway, the presentation is going to be called the doors of the church are not open. Obviously a play on one of the common cliches we use during the invitation that the doors of the church are open. And I want to reflect a little bit about what it means when the doors of the church are not open. Um, because I'm speaking from a very contextualized um, space, I want to give you a little bit of information about Alfred Street that kind of helps um, couch some of the information I'll share and put it in perspective and hopefully allow you to see where your context may be different and therefore your answers may be different. Um, as Lakeisha noted, Alfred Street is a traditional and historic church, 217 years old, uh, established in 1803, and I'm grateful to be um, the eighth pastor. In this last season of our church, God has graced us with uh, tremendous growth um, to be right under 10,000 members right now. And I want to share some dynamics that 31% of our congregation is under 40 years old. 42% is between 41 and 62 years old. And we mark 62 as that beginning of retirement phasing. And then 27% of our congregation is 63 and older. I say that for two reasons. Number one, I want to continue to speak about the necessity of data um, in this presentation and knowing your numbers. Uh, but also number two, to share that we are traditional but we're not old in the sense that uh, we are a dying church. You know, to be able to claim that 31% of our congregation is under 40 um, is a major blessing, but also a major challenge because I would argue with you that intergenerational church is more difficult than interracial or intercultural church. And trying to balance generations has its own challenges. Um, Alpha Street is graced by God with resources and membership and staff. And I understand that that gives us the ability to answer some questions differently. And I want to try to present from a perspective today of realizing that every church um, is graced at different levels of finance and member and vision and history. Um, so prayerfully, we can lift ourselves above any general context of our church and speak about the church in general. We are a traditional Baptist church. Uh, and that you can see in a few things. Choral music and hymns are way more dominant than praise and worship. Um, we dress up for church. Very rarely do we have a dress down Sunday at Alpha Tree Baptist Church. Doctrine and polity mean a lot to us. The communion table is still sacred at Alpha Tree Baptist Church. It's covered in white and you are not allowed to touch it unless you are an ordained deacon. We are a traditional Baptist church. Our deacons sit on the front row and half of them go to sleep just like any other church. So we are traditional in every sense of the word. But we are also untraditional in terms of some Baptist churches in two ways. Number one, we promote, and although we still have a long way to go, uh, we promote gender equality in all leadership and ministry. My predecessor, John O. Peterson, ordained women as deacons and ministers in the early 70s and paid a price for it. He was kicked out of every local Baptist convention because he was ahead of his time. And in the early 70s, Alfred Street got rid of deaconess and Alfred Street believed that uh, regardless of your gender, God could use you in full capacity for ministry. So we have been on the frontier of gender equality in the black church for quite some time. And because of that, I believe that we are also called to be on the forefront of inclusion around sexual identity and orientation. 
And so although we have a long way to go in that on that path, I don't believe that any leadership or ministry or service in church should be limited or exclusive to a certain uh, sexual identity and orientation. And I ask that you all pray for us on that. As you all know, that that's still a very controversial issue within the body of Christ. But I'm grateful to be part of a church um, that understands that we need to be open and relevant and that our discussions are not simply limited to quoting scripture, but also discerning God through scripture in the times in which we live. As some of you all know, I was on sabbatical recently. I felt the need to take some rest and therefore I'm really looking forward to Friday's presentation. Um, it's kind of buttressing my own journey, uh, but I had to come back early because COVID hit. And when COVID hit, I felt the call of God to be back involved in the leadership and serving of the church as we guided our way through these pandemic waters. I mean, a lot of what I'm about to share uh, was birthed from questions that we had to ask and answer as we tried to not only figure out what God was calling us to be today, but prayerfully preparing ourselves for what the church is going to be. Now, there's no way I can touch on every issue or raise every question, uh, but hopefully the things we discuss today will lead to further discussions and networking um, and information from our presenters who will come this afternoon. I also want to re really quickly thank Lakeisha and Quinta. This preparation has allowed me the opportunity to rethink about what we're doing in our church and what works and doesn't work. And that reflection is always productive. So um, thank you all for this. I want to start by sharing with you um, a core principle at Alpha Street Baptist Church. If we can go to the next slide um, before we hire people um, that on our staff of probably about 80 or 83 people, um, at different levels from full-time to part-time to contractor, there are three core principles that are critical for working in this environment. And I share them so that you can understand what's important to me. Um, Quinta, can we go to the next slide? The core principles for our church, there are three that we require um, for those who want to work alongside us. Um, the very first is what we call water walkers. Um, water walkers, um, we look at Peter, in Matthew chapter 14, who steps out of the boat and tries something new. And one of the things we look for and embrace in our church are those who are not afraid to hear the voice of God and try something that's never been done, uh, to do the unprecedented. And realizing that even if we fail, even if we sink, even if we're not successful, there's grace to save us. So in our church, we would rather, uh, there we go, thank you. In our church, we would rather um, you ask for forgiveness and permission. Um, discern God's call and be bold and brave and step out into something new. Number two, we require the second mile mentality. In Matthew 5 and the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, if someone asks you to go one mile, go two. One of the things we don't do well with in our church are those who only want to do the bare minimum, who want to do what is written on paper, but not go above and beyond. Um, we Look for those who have a desire to excel and exceed beyond expectation uh, because they realize that what they're doing, they're doing for the Lord. And so we need those to go a second mile above and beyond what's required. And then the third is the spirit of excellence. You know, we preach Daniel around here, Daniel 6 and 3, that Daniel distinguished himself because the spirit of excellence resided in him. Um, and one of the things my staff, my church knows is that we don't work well with people who are content with mediocrity, um, that if we are truly serving the kingdom, then whatever we do for God, we've got to do better than what we do in the world. I believe the church should always lead the way in corporate business and strategic planning and branding because we represent the kingdom of Christ and we are inherently gifted to do better than what the world does. And so that spirit of excellence comes as a result of three things, and this is important for where we're headed. Number one is preparation. Um, and by that, I typically mean reflective and strategic targeting. Number two, data collection for evaluation. That if you're going to be excellent, not only do you have to prepare, but you have to have some way of evaluating how you performed. And data is really the only way to evaluate. And our churches have been pretty poor on data collection. Um, we've got a saying around here at Alpha Street, in God we trust everybody else needs data. 
that we need numbers. We track numbers. And I'm going to share with you a little bit about how we do that. And then, of course, correction, uh, because mistakes will be made, but we learn from them and we adjust so that the next time is always better than the last time. Now, the title of this summit, Rethinking Church, kind of has a little fallacy in it because it almost suggests that to rethink church, we already thought about church. But if we're going to be honest, very little of what we do in our churches, particularly our black churches, are guided by strategic planning, branding, data collection, adjustments, corrections, evaluations. I want to use a um, illustration. Some of you all may remember the cartoon Peanuts, Charlie Brown. There's a cartoon one day where Lucy is out in the backyard with a bow and an arrow, and she's launching it at a fence. And wherever the arrow lands on the fence, Lucy then goes and paints a red circle around it. Charlie Brown walks up to her and asks her, why do you do it that way? Her response, this way I never miss. That literally we just shoot and whatever we hit, we then come back and say, that was our target, we never miss. And I think too often church and particularly the black church has operated that way. We just do and say whatever happened was the Holy Spirit's intent and therefore the target was hit, as opposed to actually aiming for specific targets in our ministry. And I would suggest to you, if we go to the next slide, that rethinking church is really a matter of changing or, un, or changing our lack of thinking previously. That what we're doing in this summit is seeking to start thinking about church. So rethinking is an undoing of our unthinking. It is getting away from the Lucy model of ministry where we just do whatever comes to mind and then blame the Holy Spirit for whatever the results will be. And if it worked, God wanted it to work. If it didn't work, that's because God's hand wasn't on it. Uh, but what I want us to do today is to start rethinking and unthinking our lack of thinking, if that makes any sense. Okay. So we've got to rethink church for a few reasons. And COVID-19 has brought some realities to church that I think are undeniable. And if we are not acknowledging these realities, I think that we're already setting ourselves up to fail. So if we go to the next slide, let me share with you what I want to place out there as five COVID realities that the church really has to deal with. Number one, I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are living through an extinction event. We are living through an extinction event that there are things that are dying now that will never be again. I kind of liken it to Noah. Noah is quarantined on that ark uh, for almost an entire year. The rains came for 40 days, but if you do the math, Noah's quarantined for almost a year. And when Noah steps out of quarantine, the world he knew is no longer there. It's changed significantly. And when we come out of quarantine or whatever post-pandemic looks like, I'm going to suggest to you that the world is going to be dramatically different. That masks may be the norm. Social distancing is probably going to be permanent. Large gatherings are going to be challenged. We just recently did a survey of our membership and the majority of them, almost 76%, said that they are not comfortable being in a large setting anymore. The world is going to be different. I'll give you a prime example. I used to go to the movies every Monday. That was my Sabbath. I, I would go see whatever was out. And it shocked me to find out that AMC Theaters is filing for bankruptcy. Who would have ever seen a day when the movie theater industry was not viable? But we should have seen it coming. Blockbuster didn't anticipate Netflix and AMC didn't anticipate the pandemic because now movies are going to be released directly to whatever streaming platform you have on. And that's absolutely going to kill the movie theater industry. The world is going to be different and the church is going to have to adjust to new dynamics in a different world. Number two, I would suggest to you that normal is not 
behind us, normal is in front of us. So when I hear leaders say, when are we getting back to normal? Uh, there is no more normal. We have no idea what that's going to look like. The church, I don't think, will ever look the same way it did at the end of 2019. I'll give you an example. And like many of you all, we broadcast our worship services. Well, in the past, all we used to do was get people in church for Sunday morning and press on on the cameras. We'll never do that again. We'll never be back in a space where what we broadcast online is simply a live version of what we're doing in the sanctuary, because that's almost going backwards from where the Lord has brought us during this pandemic. Normal is ahead of us. Number three, I firmly believe that COVID has exposed our church's deficiencies, that this has given us an opportunity to see where we are lacking in ministry, infrastructure, operations, connectivity, and communications. This has been like a visit to the doctor to find out where we've been insufficient in our ministry operations. Um, and part of the reason we've been allowed to be deficient is because of worship. Let me see if I can explain, because um, the next slide's gonna be a little funny. I, uh, I've been trying to lose a little, little gut weight. You know, I'm hitting these 40s now, and there's a little bit of, little bit of this that I'm trying to work out. And my trainer, told me, man, listen, you got to get this new thing called cutting weight that you wear around your stomach. I said, what is it? He said, it's like Spanx for men. And I started laughing. I said, Spanx doesn't make anything for men. Spanx is for women. He said, no, Spanx is for men too. And I was joking with a member and I said, yeah, I got to start wearing Spanx for, uh, to, you know, to cover up some of this gut. And my member said something. It's a lady. She said something funny. She said, pastor, Spanx are a gift from God because they cover a multitude of sins that spanks cover a multitude of sin. I want to suggest to you that worship as corporate and communal also covered a multitude of our sins, that getting in the building and having worship allowed us on Sunday to get away with a whole lot of things we weren't doing well Monday through Saturday. We would get in the building, and as long as service was packed, as long as the sermon went all right and people shouted, as long as the choir sang well, as long as the spirit moved, as long as someone joined, as long as the offering was okay, we allowed what we saw on Sunday to cover up the deficiencies of ministry and operations throughout the rest of the week. And what the Lord has done in this season by removing that corporate worship is really to expose some of the deficiencies in our ministry. And what we have found as we try to fill those gaps is that in all honesty, what we're doing now is what we should have been doing before COVID hit. Some of the things we're doing now are really just deficiencies of what should have been handled in our operations. And so worship covered a multitude of sins. I think that's the next slide, uh, Quint, if we can put that up, that, that what we were doing on Sunday allowed us to get away with a whole lot of Monday through Friday. That corporate and communal worship covered a multitude of sins. Let's go to the next one, Quinta, if that's okay. So not only has COVID exposed us, not only has COVID um, caused us to relook at church, but it's also opened the door for new creative, visionary, and successful ministry opportunities that this season has given us the opportunity to do some things new, some things that are visionary, some things that are successful. You know, it's kind of like the early church in the book of Acts, how the thought was that the persecution that the Pharisees enacted upon the Christians would actually shut the church down, but in actuality, what it did was spread it. Let's go to the next slide. Um, that COVID may have shut our doors but it's really given us an opportunity to expand our ministry. That although the church may be closed, there are new opportunities for ministry that we've got to be good stewards of. Let me give you an example. Our viewership at Alpha Street has gone up to about 22,000 per weekend. When in the past, we could probably over all four of our services, see about 3,000 people in the building and maybe another two or three online 
So we were averaging maybe about six or 7,000 viewers over the weekend. And now we're at a place where we're getting over 22,000, which is a, and 46% of those aren't even in our local area. So of the 22,000 that are watching, 46% don't even have the capacity to get into our church building. And that statistic raised some questions. What is membership to your church? Is your membership limited to those who can get in the building? Or do you sense an obligation and an opportunity to build connection with those who may never walk foot on your campus? And I would argue with you that if you can get a business degree from Harvard and never set foot in a Harvard classroom, then maybe just maybe we ought to rethink what it means to be able to be a member of a church, even if we don't set foot in the building. And what is our responsibility to these 22,000 people, 46% of whom can't get to our building? What do we do when we reopen our doors? Does that mean that we just shut them off? Does that mean we just cut them out and say, well, so sad, too bad, you can't get in the building? Or do we now have an obligation to somehow be connected in ministry to those who can't get in our building. So COVID has created opportunities. And as much as I hate to use this term, we have to rethink church because whether you like it or not, your church is now in competition. Competition may not be the right word for colleagues in ministry, but right now, if the truth be told, your church can be easily put in comparison with other ministries that were previously geographically ineligible to your members. Let me say that again. Whatever you're doing now can be put in direct comparison to ministries that were geographically ineligible to your members. You're not competing against them, but you are going to be put in comparison against them. Let me say this. If in the past, if we got you in the building, you were forced to stay if you didn't like the choir, if you didn't like the sermon, you didn't just get up and, well, most of us didn't just get up and leave. We suffered through it. But now, as people are watching you online, if they don't like the product, and forgive me for using that term, but if they don't like the product, they can easily shut off. And you can watch your numbers. Data is important. You can watch your numbers. You can watch the numbers increase as the broadcast goes, and you can watch it decrease. When we first started in COVID, we were airing old services, and our numbers told the whole story. 4,000 people logged on when it began. Within the first three minutes of realizing that it was an old service, that number dropped down to 1,200. You can watch the data and know that people are logging off of your broadcast. And not only can they log off easily without being embarrassed, now they can log on to someone else. Your members can go to Elevation and watch Steve Furtick at the drop of a dime. Elevation may not have been accessible to them before. They were in the building. They couldn't get to North Carolina. But now they can watch Elevation online. And guess what? Elevation has been doing online for a long time. And they are good at what they do. That was a wake-up call for us at Alfred Street because we, we deluded ourselves into believing that if we got you in the building, nobody could beat us. Traditional church, we did it right. We got the pipe organ. We got 200 voices in the choir. We sing the hymns. We preach the sermons. The congregation is full. But if you removed us out the building and put us online in comparison with these other ministries, we sucked and we had to start doing better in order to match the comparison and, dare I say, the competition. So what I want to do quickly for the next maybe 10 or 15 minutes is share with you what we started looking at, what we started questioning, what we started doing, and prayerfully that will leave for some time for discussion for us. Let me frame it. Um, by listing out some of the purposes of church. And I want to use some of what I received from Rick Warren and his book, Purpose Driven Church, where, you know, he outlines the five purposes of church. And I want to add some supplemental to that so that we can view church from the lens of these 
maybe five or seven purposes and areas. So Quinta, if we can go to the next slide, that's important to put up this next one. I want to share with you the different areas of church that I think we've got to look at. We've got to look at ministry. We've got to look at worship, mission, evangelism, discipleship, and our operations. And I'm going to merge some of those together, but operations, ministry, worship, mission, evangelism, discipleship, that those are the broad categories where we started asking some questions. Let me start with operational and administrative. If we go to the next slide. The operational, operationally and administratively, the question I think we all have to ask is where are our churches deficient? Where have we learned that there's some gaps in what we need in order to operate efficiently in this season. We have found that for us as a church, number one, we are deficient in staffing. We had some staffing gaps, particularly in four categories. Audiovisual, meaning your recording team and your equipment. That if you didn't have the technology before this began, that has to be an investment you're willing to make. The technology and the team to use it. I'm going to argue with you that if your broadcast is someone holding a cell phone, projecting on Facebook Live, that you've got to up that a little bit, right? That AV is important. Along with that, of course, IT, which gives you the infrastructure for all that you've got to do online. I can't tell you how many times we've had to redo our Wi-Fi. I can't tell you how many times we've had to upgrade our software. I can't tell you how many times we've had to change our operating systems. You need an AV team and you need IT professionals. One of the most important positions for churches to have in this season is video graphic editing. I did not know, and we took for granted, how much editing has to happen after you record. When you're producing live and just hitting on, you don't have to worry about editing as much. But if you want to produce excellence after the recording, you need people to do graphic editing. So if you've ever watched Alpha Tree and you've seen the virtual choir with all the different faces and voices and blending, that took about 40 hours of editing time from the editing team. That's a full-time position. Graphic editing is critical in this season. And then we've now had to create a new department for creative production to handle social media, website, branding, communications, all of that goes under the creative content for all of our online productions. So we were deficient in staffing. We were definitely deficient in data collection. And I want to suggest to you that online worship and ministry gives us the opportunity for real time, real data collection. And data is critical for evaluation and ministry. You've got to know the numbers. Proverbs 27, verse 23 says, be diligent to know the state of your flock and give them attention. You've got to know, got to know the data. And there's nothing that prevents you from collecting it because everything is electronic. We can tell you to the, the exact number how many people watched service last week. We can tell you to the exact number how many people logged on to Bible study. We can tell you to the exact number how many people gave. You've got to know those numbers. Those numbers help drive your vision. So I'm giving an example. We had a request from a member who said, Pastor, I live on the West Coast and your early services are too early given the time discrepancy for us to watch. Could you do a later broadcast? So, of course, there's discussion about, well, does that make sense? Will it be worth it? We did the later broadcast at 2 p.m. and we saw the numbers. The numbers were always more than 2,000 people. So that data verified for us that this was something we should keep doing. Now, if we had done it, and there are only 23 watching, we probably would have said that's not something we should continue. But the data helps us verify what's being successful. You've got to be involved in data collection. We were deficient in a culture of generosity and gratitude. We had a member who was watching Elevation Church, and forgive me for keep mentioning that, but they're probably leading the way right now. And she gave for the first time, she gave a donation to Elevation. And she got a handwritten letter and an email from Steve Furtick. Now, I don't know if he did it himself, but he got they got it from Steve Furtick, thanking them for their first donation. And she was amazed 
at how with one time gift, the pastor sent a letter of gratitude to her. We should have been doing that all the time. You know what it is for someone to give to your ministry and not get a thank you? It's ungrateful. It's disrespectful. And we should have been marking our first time donors all this time and sending them letters of gratitude. We expect members to give. If you've been a member for 20 years, yes, we expect you to give. And we want to say thank you. But if you're giving for the very first time, imagine what it does to receive it. Now, the problem for most of our churches is that we don't have the mechanism to track when someone is a first time giver. One of the things we notice is that if a member's giving goes down from a hundred a year to two dollars a year, something has happened and someone should call them just to ask, are you okay? Not to ask about money, but to track the data and realize that all of a sudden Quinta's family used to give a thousand dollars a year. They're now giving two. Something may be going on and we should be contacting them. Thank you letters should be given. Large donors. This past weekend, we had a donor give $65,000. It's my obligation to reach out and say thank you. One of the things I want to suggest to you is some donor analytics called Glue. You see it there on the screen, G-L-O-O. I want you to Google that. Software to help you watch your data. We use their donor analytics. We use their insight. And we use Church Pulse. There are three sub softwares from glue that we use donor analytics church insight and church pulse that will help you collect and analyze data for ministry formation i cannot tell you enough how important that software is now there may be other versions but there ought to be something in your church that's helping you collect the data so that you can analyze the ministry and see the opportunities that god has given us and finally we knew we needed to grow in transparency and governance and accountability. Members' confidence is high when they know how decisions are made and who's making them. So our executive leadership team is meeting tonight in a webinar format, and we have 317 members who've requested an email link to just be able to watch our deliberations. 317, that's almost as much as we get at a church meeting. But members want transparency in how decisions are made and transparency and where the money goes. Too often in black church, we expect people to give with no accountability for where that money goes. And we give into a black hole. Well, at Alpha Tree, we have found that when we are open with our books, transparent with our accounting, because anything done to the glory of God should never be done in darkness. Anything done to the glory of God does not have to be done in darkness. And if we give accountability, we have found that our giving numbers always go up. Then when members see the money is not being spent on some private jet, it's not being spent in some inordinate salary for the pastor, it's not being spent in some new vehicles, but it's being spent in mission work and in ministry and feeding the hungry and touching the poor, people give more when their confidence is up. But that requires transparency. Let's go to the next one, Quinta. I need to move quickly. I'm sorry, everyone. The next area um, for us outside of operational is ministry and discipleship. If we can pull that one up. There we go. Um, the question we began to ask here is, how are you developing leaders and building support among members? 90% of church ministries fall in three categories, service, support, or discipleship. Service ministries that provide a service to the church, ushers, choir, willing worker, sunshine committee, culinary ministry, parking lot volunteers, greeters. Those are service ministries. Support ministries are those ministries that bring people together based on a common affinity. Single mothers, men's ministry, young adult ministry, our Bikers for Christ ministry, our ministry for motorcycle riders. Those are support ministries. And then of course, discipleship, which is meant to deal with spiritual formation. I would suggest to you that most ministries of service have been shut down and now have to operate as ministries of support. So the question we're asking is, what are we doing to put these ministries in virtual relationship with one another to support each other? How are we helping leaders develop? So not only are we mandating that our ministries have virtual meetings, but we're doing leadership modules for the fall, recording leadership lessons, 
that are being videoed so that our leaders can watch online and continue to grow even though they're no longer in active service. And one of the things we have found out is that it requires a coordinator. That it's not something you can just expect to happen. Someone needs to be assigned to make certain that ministries are meeting, that leaders are developing, and we've switched most of our discipleship to online. A new form of Bible study, can I push it? Dr. Judy does OTOG. We're now filming a Bible basics course for people who want to know more about what the Bible is. We're doing uh, three sessions on how to pray, and we've got our intercessory prayer team filming um, the basics of prayer. And the good news is that once those are filmed, they can be put online, people can watch them on demand, and they're always accessible. Next slide. So we've got operations, we've got ministry, we've got discipleship. Let's go on to membership. This is probably our greatest area of opportunity as a church. We've actually grown during this season. Since April the 1st, when we shut our doors, 514 people have joined Alfred Street online. 514. We are averaging 32 new members a week, which is more than double what we averaged when we were in the building. I just want you to see the opportunity that God has given. When we were in the building, we averaged between seven and 10. We are now averaging 32 new members a week. Why? Because we're reaching people outside of the local church. Outside of that area, 107 don't even live in the DMV area, can never get in our church. And 65 are candidates for baptism. So those numbers made us ask a whole lot of difficult questions. Number one, who is a member? Who's eligible for full benefits? Do you actually have to be in the building to be considered a member of the church? And what are our responsibilities to those who want to claim to be members. We have a lady who lives in Utah who will tell you she is a bona fide member of Alpha Street Baptist Church, that she watches online, she gives, she's connected in every way except physically, and you cannot tell her that she's not a member of Alpha Street. And so we have to wrestle with what is our responsibility to her? How do we minister to her? Is there a mechanism for orienting new members? Do you have an online new member orientation? Most of us have one in person. All you've got to do is film it and upgrade it and put it online and require new members to watch it. And more importantly, how do we connect to them? Because church is not about numbers, it's about relationship. So how do we connect to these people who are online who may never set foot in our building? Your answer may be different, but Quint, if we can go to the next slide, we have instituted what we call care calls. Care calls are made by our deacons, and every member of Alpha Street Baptist Church receives a care call from their deacon no less than two times a year, and sometimes as many as four. The care calls are simple. Number one, to connect with members. It is a, hey, I am Deacon Howard Wesley. I'm calling to check on you and your family. How are you doing? Number two is to assist with any concerns. Is there anything you all are struggling with that the church can help you with? Number three, to relay prayer requests. We're praying for you. Is there anything happening you want us to pass on to the pastor? And through those care calls, the deacons let me know who I need to be praying for and who I need to be contacting. Pastor, you need to call Sister Womack's family. Her mother is struggling with cancer, such and such. And then finally, to equip them with information that the last part of the call is to share with them, hey, this is what's happening. We'll let you know the church is not opening now up until at least Labor Day. If you have any questions, here's where to go. So the care calls connect, they assist, they relay, and they equip. And in this virtual season, you getting that call two to three, four times a year allows you to know that you've not been forgotten and that the church cares about you. Okay. On top of that, we also have our small group initiatives that are meeting virtually online to keep members connected. Let's move on to evangelism and then mission and worship, and we're going to be done. Evangelism. How are we spreading the gospel and making disciples? Well, in this season, it's really two ways, one of which is very easy. 
evangelism through exposure. Your church online is now exposed to more people than those who simply walked in your building. So part of the evangelism happens simply because we're online now. So let me give you an example. We received a message from a young lady on Twitter, a white young lady who said she's an atheist. She wasn't religious. She called us online. And ever since then, she's gone out and found all the YouTube. She's watched everything. And she's now given her life to Christ. That, to me, is evangelism. She messaged us on Twitter. Now, what's important for us is to see that message and have some mechanism in place that reaches back out to her immediately. Here's a woman who didn't believe, who's watched, now wants to give her life to Christ. Now we've got to make certain we're following up on that, that we're reaching out to her, that something in church has to be structured to reach the evangelism by exposure. And then secondly, we're doing evangelism by equipping, trying to create new modules to teach our members how to share their faith personally. So here's the great thing about this season. Evangelism can no longer be confused with inviting people to church. No longer can you as a member think you have met the Great Commission by inviting your neighbor to come sit in church with you. Now we've got to really work on spreading the gospel heart to heart, person to person, and we're trying to equip our members to do that. Let's move on to the last ones, missions, missions. Any church that's struggling with missions in paying attention. Missions is all about how do we touch people with the transformative love of Jesus. And those opportunities are all around us. The church has an opportunity now to touch the hungry, to touch children, to touch the sick, to do COVID testing, to provide food supplies. This is a great fertile season for mission. And if you've been watching us, we've done something called Tithe the Tithe where every Sunday we take 10% of what was raised and donated to organizations outside the church who are making a difference. Maybe we can't do COVID testing. Maybe we can't do a food drive, but we know organizations in our local community that are, and we're sowing into them. And I promise you all this, the more we sow, the more people give. The more they see the money going into the hearts of those who need it, the more they're releasing it from their own heart. Mission opportunity abound. And then the final one is worship. I say worship for last simply because I think it's the most complicated. Um, and if we go to the next screen, Quintus, the last one, um, how are we worshiping? What is the goal? Oh, no, go back one if you will, Quinta. What is the goal of our worship service? A few questions I think every church has to ask. Uh, nope, go forward. One more. Quinta, we're almost there. There we go. Right there. Um, number one, are we trying to recreate what we used to do on Sunday or create something new totally? That's an answer you have to come up with. We believe that we have to do something new because without that call and response and without the members in the building, we just believe that the worship online should look different. You got to take into consideration the length of your broadcast. Remember this, the average YouTube viewership between 16 and 19 minutes, 16 and 19 minutes, which means you've got to be careful of trying to redo a two hour worship service. I would suggest a target of one hour with a 25 to 30 minute sermon at most. Your homiletical methodology has to be considered. I'm excited to log back on this afternoon. I, I really want to encourage you to listen to I Homiletic by uh, Dr. Dominique Robinson, the Dean of Chapel at Wiley. I believe she's right on target with understanding how our preaching has to look in a season like this, that I homiletic will bless you. Um, the appeal to giving is important. And then finally, of course, the quality of production. So let me close because I know we're up on time. Not forget, forgive me for being long. I just believe that there are unprecedented opportunities waiting us in the new normal that awaits us and that we're prepared to meet these challenges. My prayer is that your church will ask the right questions and that God will help you discern the right answers as you rethink church. Thank you, everyone, for the hour I've been able to share with you. I think now we move to some questions that are going to be moderated. 
Yes, yes, yes. And thank you so much for that dynamic presentation. Um, one thing that you said that really hit home for me is the fact that if we look at the data, T.D. Jakes, Elevation, Joel Osteen, they have had members across the country who consider themselves members but have never stepped foot in their church, never stepped foot, sometimes even in the state that they're in, yet they consider themselves members, but we've been so resistant to this. What made you and your congregation embrace this thought process? Well, I will say this quickly. It was about a year debate and discussion because there was a lot of you know, there's a theological position that says, one, we ought to force people to find a local church that by receiving them into ours, we're doing damage to the body of Christ. Then came the discussion about legal, uh, because when you use the term member, there's a legal benefit for voting. And the question was, should someone who lives in Utah be allowed to vote on the critical matters of the church? So a lot of discussion that happened over a year with some prayer. And then we just finally came to the decision that if someone wants to connect with us, we should not deny them that opportunity, that 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 membership may be at a whole different lot of levels. They may call themselves a member. They still may visit other churches. They may watch others online. But if they're being blessed by us, we have a responsibility to care for them. And what pushed us over the edge was just wanting to care for those who connect with us and to open the doors of our church for membership. Open Pandora's box when you started talking about this on membership, because the question that I saw repeatedly, what do you do about baptism for your online members? How do you baptize the people that you can't touch? So, so one, that's a question we're asking right now, just during COVID with 65 new candidates for baptism and not being able to get them in the water. So clearly that will be dealt with once our doors open back up. And I can't speak too openly now, but we've got something coming in our local area that's going to handle it, but I can't reveal it yet because the members don't know it yet. So I got to keep that quiet. But it's a bigger question about those in different areas. One of the things we're blessed to have the resource to do is that when we realize we have a volume of members in a local area, what we're doing is either when I'm on the road or intentionally sending myself or our online pastor to those areas and to perform those baptisms there. So if I'm in San Diego preaching, we're going to reach out to everyone in that area and say, hey, listen, pastors in town, we're hosting a dinner at Maggiano's and we're inviting all of you all to come to meet and greet the pastor. And we're going to handle baptisms the next day because we don't believe we need a baptismal pool. We'll baptize you at the YMCA. You know, we'll take you right down there and baptize. But it's just reaching out in those areas. So as we track data, we know when we have seven new members in this area and eight over here. And I've hired an online pastor and his job is to fly to those areas, meet with those people, handle those baptisms and let them collect in a small group so that we are now ministering across the nation by sending our people there. Awesome. Um, what do you say to pastors? Because I know some of you are thinking this, y'all didn't say it. But we say, you know, I'm too small to do all of this. My church doesn't have, you know, 10,000 members. What do you say to those small congregations who need to embrace this work regardless of the size? Um, I would say that the size is kind of irrelevant. Caring for members, making phone calls, that's not about size. Uh, making certain that you have online orientation, that's not about size. That's, that's really just about the discipline and the diligence and utilizing the volunteer base. We're blessed to have staff, but every church, I believe God has equipped every church with volunteers who are competent and capable for the vision God has for that church, right? So it's about one, just deciding we're going to do it and then finding people who want to volunteer. Most, most people in church are waiting to be asked, you know, waiting to be involved. I guarantee you, you've got a social media guru in your church right now who you don't have to pay, who knows everything about TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat, everything. And they're just waiting for someone in church to say, hey, how can how can we utilize this tool for our church? So it's utilizing the resources God has given. Stop declaring that you're too small to do anything and actually just start doing the small things. It doesn't take a lot to make calls. It doesn't take a lot to video. It doesn't take a lot to use your social media, right? That, that those are not limited based on size. That's just limited based on vision and the hard work it takes to get the volunteers trained. Totally agree. Going back to what you uh, mentioned about evaluation. So oof, that's a big one because a lot of churches, like, like that's a whole new concept for them. 
share with us how like what the process looks like for um, mining data and evaluating and what type of person or position does that entail? Because I think for churches who don't know, it's like, oh, so we're just collecting like numbers. But how how do you create the process for analyzing that data? I know that's a hard one. Yeah, I, I want to say that that's complicated because uh, one, you've actually got to collect it first, so you have to have some way of keeping account. Um, so you've got to have someone who wants to keep count of how many people logged on and watched. We've got to count how many people show up to an event. Um, we've got to we've got to analyze that it stay under budget or above. So there are all these metrics that glue will help you identify. Now you don't have to use all of them. You may decide that a given event only needs three metrics, or you may decide a given event may need all 17 or 23. So we're plugging those numbers in for every event we do. So there's a part of my staff who that's what they do. The ministry programming, they plug in the data for every event. So if a choir had a luncheon, the choir has to turn in how many people were at the luncheon, what was the budget, what was the overall effect, and also doing some evaluations with those who attended. You know, here's a survey. Can you tell us how you enjoyed this or such and such? So that data is collected. Once a week in our manager's meeting, we review the previous um, events and just look at how they went. Just overall, just keep it in mind. Maybe not too much analysis, maybe just information. The real burden, Lakeisha, is on me. At the end of the year, I have to produce a pastor's report to my board and to the church showing the church's health and analyzing that data, right? So that's when you become more than the preacher who can hoop and bring Jesus up from the dead. That's when you become the corporate leader analyzing data and writing a corporate report. It's almost a 30 page report that I've got to write every year, but it helps us track and it helps us plan so that when we sit down in the fall for our retreat and map out the next three to five years of church, we've got data that kind of tells us which way the Lord is pointing. So it's very laborious but it's also very fruitful. Definitely, and um, I'm a day person, so I, I love it, and I pray that more churches- yeah, Bob, you want to come work for me? <laughs> 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 no, <laughs> I have too much data. No, I'm just joking. Um, but going back to, um, to what you talked about, about leadership development, what are some um, tools that you're using to develop your leaders? And um, you know, are you sending them to conferences? Are you doing the work yourself? Are you bringing in consultants? Um, how do you- build the capacity within the people that you have to do this work? So a lot of it starts with me um, and sharing leadership principles. Um, my ministry team just put together four modules they need me to record. So one is like on how to cast vision, the other is how to build relationship and have people follow. So our leaders tend to receive more from their own pastor than they do. But when we had the capacity, we, we would identify some conferences where we'd send, so a small group conference, we sent people to, we sent people to Andy Stanley's conference. I mean, I think it's important to realize that there's some people out in the kingdom who are doing some things really well, and we can learn from them. So we sent people to the small group conference uh, with Bill Hybels. We sent them to Andy Stanley's Rethinking Church that he did. We sent them to um, Elevations Conference on Hospitality. Um, and different segments of leadership. I do some training probably twice a year. Um, we also have leadership development books uh, that is a monthly read for us here within our staff that we recommend. And then I allow other leaders to do some presentations as well. So I don't think you can ever find enough boxes to check uh, because people can't come to everything. They'll pick what they like. Uh, but as long as we're offering that, that, that variety, I think it's necessary because leadership happens in so many different levels and so many different capacities from managers to someone who's just a section leader in the altos. But the better you can train them and pour into them, the better they can build. Because we believe at Alpha Street, and I keep saying this, the church is not about membership, it's about relationship. And if you don't know how to build relationship, you can never lead. So that's the core principle. How do we build productive relationships? It's so important. Um, so this is a tough issue that I think a lot of churches deal with. A lot of 
churches are run like social clubs. So you have people in leadership who are not qualified for the position, nor are they. I know, shocking, right? <laughs> but but so, so how do you do like evaluations? If you find someone who, you know, they may be passionate or they may have gotten into the position, but they're not effective. How do you evaluate their performance and make those hard decisions to make sure that you have um, the right people in position? So I think it starts, number one, with sharing core principles and values across the board with your entire leadership, right? So it's not about me uh, evaluating you individually. It's about sharing, here's our standard, right? We want water walkers. We want spirit of excellence. And let that become normative so that when we have a leader who doesn't live up to it, that it's easy to say, hey, listen, here's the problem. We've sharing, this is our core, and you're not operating like that. You don't value relationships, um, that you're great at producing an event, but once you're done, the whole team resigns and no one wants to work with you again, right? So one, it's about creating the norm so that when you have number two, the difficult conversation, then number three, that person can't find support in other leadership to back them because they identify you're not operating according to the church's principles. So you got to set a norm. You got to teach it. You got to implement it. It's got to become core. Then you got to have the courage to have the difficult conversation of saying this isn't working. That doesn't mean you are hell bound. That doesn't mean you're a sinner. That doesn't mean you're not good. It just means that this is not a good fit, right? It's not a good fit. And then we've got to make some changes for the welfare of the church and then be willing to deal with the consequence, which means you may lose some people, right? But we have found church health is always better. So I have a model, Lakeisha, and I'm going to answer the question like this. At Alf Street, we refuse to be held hostage by talent. I don't care how gifted you are. If you're not good for the well-being of the church, your talent is not going to hold us hostage, right? Just because you can sing that song better than someone else doesn't mean we need to put up with your gospel attitude. So we're going to move you. And as a, as a leader, I've got to be prepared to have those difficult conversations in love because the welfare of the church is important. You just made my heart smile. Um, <laughs> a question about data because we know that numbers can be manipulated so how do you stay true to the numbers and not you know allow the numbers to um, tell the story that they're not actually um, telling if that makes sense that's tough because um, you're right um, so one I think it's important to, to share all the data that we have right that it all goes on the table you know so when the president says we're doing better than any other country. Well, it's easy to say that when you remove the countries that are doing better than us from the data, right? So yeah, we're the best out there, you know, but we're gonna remove Great Britain, take France off the list, don't talk about Spain, and then put America up. Oh, look how good we are. So, you know, one, put all the data out. But two, I think the guard, the guard against that is having a lot of eyes lay on it. That it can't just be one set because I, I can't see what I don't see, right? I need people around me my dad once said, surround yourself with people who see what you see and people who see what you miss. So because we believe in transparency of all that we do, you know, deacons get to see, the church council sees, the staff sees. And as we all look at that data, my prayer is that, so I have, I have a, a, another saying that I, as a pastor, bring an idea, but in the collective room, we discern vision. That I believe that vision is best discerned, not just me and my own prayer life with the Lord, but in counsel and communication with those whom the Lord has called to this position. So our vision is clearer in a room of 12 than it is in the heart of one. So put all the data out and let as many eyes look at it as possible and then learn to listen. And I think that's the best way to prevent the manipulation. Awesome. So um, final question, and then we're going to let you go. Um, in the Presentation, you talked about the necessity for inclusion of all people. Um, how did your congregation react to that? And how do you kind of navigate in a church culture that just really does not value um, the inclusion of, you know, maybe people who have different lifestyle choices, as well as people um, uh, like females in ministry and leadership? How, how have you been able to navigate um, those issues? Well, let me say one, I'm grateful to be part of a church that has always exhibited courage on the frontier of these issues. So it would almost 
So for us to have ordained women in the 70s, it'd also be hypocritical for us now to say, oh, but we're gonna close our door to our LGBTQIA brothers and sisters. That's just not the spirit of our church. Number two, we, we, we accept and acknowledge that this church isn't for everybody, right? So that, that position has cost us and it has grown us. So let's be clear, you know, for those who say that's not my environment, there are many others who said that's exactly where I'm looking to be. And every church isn't for everybody. Uh, beyond that, so theologically, one of the things we try to do is create an atmosphere that's welcome and inclusive. I, I don't want to split hairs between open and affirming, because for me, the issue is not just about what the Bible says, and I don't need to affirm your sexuality. What I do need to do is be open and welcoming to you in relationship with me. So I'm clear on preaching that I'm not going to judge you for something and I'm not going to be judged. If you are lesbian and I am heterosexual, I don't have to judge who you choose to love because the Lord's not going to judge me for that. Right. So we try to push what the real responsibility of a Christian is. And that's love. So Dr. Valerie Bridgman, one of my mentors, said that someone came to her once and asked, are gays going to hell? And her response is, I don't know that, but I know we are for the way we treat them. And that's what got to our church, that we began pushing what that person does in their personal life has nothing to do with their ability to contribute to the body of Christ, nor my responsibility to love them. Because even if you being gay is a sin, and I don't believe that, but let's say you believe that, do you then think that God gives you a pass to be exclusive and exclusionary to someone because you disagree with the way they've chosen to live their life? If the door were closed to every sinner, all of us are on our way to hell. So we try to lift up a bigger standard and we accept the fact that it's controversial, that everyone doesn't love it. People leave when they find that out. And that's OK, because I promise you, for every person that's left, two more have joined. I love that, because I think we do have to be courageous in our love for others and not judgmental in that love, because sometimes our judgment hurts more <laughs> than our courage. Um, the church has done more damage to the LGBTQIA community than any other political figure, than any other segment. And I just think that that's a, that's a horrible indictment on the body of Christ. You know, especially when we wanna look to a few mosaic laws and Pauline principles, but nothing that emanates out the mouth of Jesus himself. Don't get me started. If you wanna take your stance against LGBTQIA, you're limited to Moses and Paul, but you don't have an ounce of Jesus. I'm sorry, that, that's just me. That's why we brought a preacher because we need the word. <laughs> we need the word. And that's what you know this is all about is like rethinking a lot of the traditions that have been ingrained in us. But when you really go back to the word, like I always ask people when they try to tell me what I should and shouldn't be doing, I'm like, is that tradition or is it scripture? Because if it's scripture, we can talk about it. But if it's your tradition, then that doesn't mean that I have to be held to that standard. So, um, as we close your presentation, what parting words do you have to our viewers about rethinking church and, you know, just one takeaway if you wanted them to do something different or something um, to help them advance their ministries as they're rethinking? So one thing I forgot to say that I hope is a word of encouragement, and that is that with the church door being closed, financial resources are not being expended in places that they normally were, which means that there's some financial opportunity there. So with that financial resource, I would suggest an investment either in staff or the software. Glue is real important. Again, there may be others out there. We, we use glue because data collection and analysis is critical for ministry discernment. And if there's one thing I could push is don't ignore the data. Don't close your eyes. Don't pat yourself on the back and think that if you felt good about the sermon, that means the church is healthy and well. There's so much more involved, especially in this season where we have to monitor more than our hoop and, you know, our praise breaks in worship. There's so much more because worship covered a multitude of sins. So let's take this as a golden opportunity God has given to do something new, to set our eyes on something new and not say, oh, we're just waiting to go back to where we were. Because if you go back there, you've missed the season that God has created. This is a golden opportunity for the church to fill in some deficiencies, to move in some new ways, and to really, in my mind, fulfill our commandment to be witnesses of Christ to the ends of the earth. And the ends of the earth is given to us 
by online, by tech and technology, by social media, we can fulfill our great commandment. Amen, amen. That's what I've been teaching, that this is the first time in civilization that we've had the opportunity to truly fulfill the great commission. Um, we have international people who have registered for this event. And if we had held this in person, there's no way they would have had access to this information. So we have to embrace our mandate, not just to affect our local community, but to affect the global community. So thank you so much for taking time out of your day to come and share with us. Our um, chat is just going off. Like they love the presentation. They love like everything that you've shared. You've challenged some people and prayerfully, um, they will make some shifts in the way that they look at data and um, doing ministry. So thank you so much to all of our attendees. You have 15 minutes to get yourselves together and get ready for the next session.